Okay, so today I thought I would talk about a topic um, that I've been thinking about a lot. Um, I'm kind of developing a concept of what I would call rationalized need and uh, obsolescence. So let me talk a little bit about this concept and how it affects our clients, our spirituality, our perspective on the present, and relationships in general. Um, next week we'll talk about grief and loss, and I thought that would go well with home visitations, um, long-term care facilities, uh, hospital visitations, things like that. So. A long time ago, uh, one of my friends worked in a stereo store, and um, I was always into all kinds of stereos, as you can see behind me. But um, I was I was looking at some of the things they had in there. I knew he could get a great discount, and I gave him a call. I said, "Hey, hey, Tim, I really need a new set of speakers. I love those Klipsch Heresies." And uh, when I was done talking about them, he's like, well, Grafton, do you, do you really need those speakers or do you want those speakers? And what I had done is I had rationalized something that was totally unnecessary in my life, but something I enjoyed. Um, and I had turned a want into a need in my mind when it really wasn't a need at all. Um, this got me thinking uh, that so many times uh, in our society and our individual lives we we rationalize these things. Um, so when we think about it there's Maslow's hierarchy of needs and um, Needs are often incorporated into other theories uh, as well, like basic needs. Um, so Glasser talks about basic needs. Other theorists talk about basic needs. Basic needs and, uh, and Maslow's needs all include things like, um, on the lowest level, the foundational level, they always include things like um, food, shelter, clothing, things that we need for survival. And then we also should include safety. And then um, in different orders, uh, love, belonging, power, freedom, fun, transcendence. Um, so all of those things go into different theories um, and they have them in different orders moving up the ladder or the pyramid. But when we really think about our lives, we live in the United States in a, a capitalistic society and this is seen as a very positive thing in the United States. Um, it's seen as something that helps us financially. It's seen as something that helps our, our nation. Individualism is often uh, upheld as you know, a great merit that we could have, as opposed to things like a shame culture or culture that focuses on community rather than the individual, such as Native American cultures. Um, so when we think about this concept and we combine it with a concept of obsolescence, it really kind of changes um, the way we might look at these things. So let's look at the concept of obsolescence. A hundred years ago, or basically any time before World War II, so any time before 1944, um, the mentality was to 
create a product that would last a lifetime or as long as possible, something with very high quality. In addition, um, there were still apprenticeships, things like that. People would do a lot of things uh, with great care uh, in producing products. Yes, Henry Ford earlier during the Industrial Revolution uh, came up with the assembly line, which really began to change this process. So people didn't make one thing at a time anymore uh, in factories. They would mass produce products. But before 1946, the, the primary selling point was quality. People would spend a lot of money on something. They would work hard to get something. Um, and they would use that for an extended period of time. An additional factor would be that there were lots and lots of uh, businesses uh, that could repair different products. Things are very different now for a number of reasons. The first reason is that we have lots of technological advances. They happen very quickly. Um, look at cell phones, advances every year. Um, in addition, um, very few things are made by an individual person. Most things are mass produced. Um, another thing is that um, quality is still seen as a selling point. However, cost rivals quality. Um, so not only do things become obsolete because of um, technological advances, but they also wear out a lot more quickly. Um, and because prices are considerably lower based on, um, in relation to our income in the general population, um, it's almost easier to buy something new than to repair something. So a famous question in an interview for an engineer for uh, a company was, what's the best way to fix this problem? You have a broken toaster and all the different people in the interview would say different things, how to fix the toaster, uh, what it would take to fix the toaster. But the correct answer is to throw the toaster away and to buy a new toaster because their time as an engineer in the factory was more valuable than fixing the toaster. Well, this has a lot of implications, this, this mentality that it is easier to dispose of something than to buy something new than to repair something. So when we combine rationalized need, technological innovations, obsolescence, um, we come up with a very different mindset in modern society. The first mindset is that Many times, um, we don't actually need a product, but they, corporations advertise it and they sell it to us in a way that it helps us to rationalize it and turn it from a want into a need. And most of the advertising uh, is operant or classical conditioning. Uh, it plays into those basic needs. Um, so for instance, uh, if you look at houses built in 1939, the average house in a upper middle class neighborhood in the United States had six rooms, had about two and a half bedrooms, one bathroom, kitchen, 
small living room, and a dining room. Um, it might have a garage. Uh, often not. That's about 1,300 square feet. People were extremely happy to have a house like that. A normal family size was three children uh, living comfortably in a house like that. You can still see houses like that in Mount Lebanon, uh, in the South Hills, all around Pittsburgh. Um, that was kind of the American dream. Today, the average square footage of a house for the same comparable income is over double that square footage um, and over double the amount of rooms. And yet, family size is two and a half, two children on average. Um, so, so many times, think about rationalized need. Think about the things we say we need. Do we need a bigger house or do we want a bigger house? Do we need a new car or do we need, do we need it or do we want it? Do I need a new cell phone or do I want a new cell phone? Um, I know people who still have the flip phone. Um, I know people who resisted cell phones for years. Uh, so there's so many types of examples in our lives where we spend a lot of time and thought and effort and money and work to acquire stuff. Stuff that we don't need, but stuff that we have rationalized in our own minds that we need, but we really just want it. And we're kind of sold this rationalization. Combine that with obsolescence and new technology, and um, there's a lot of uh, discarded material items. Um, as a result of this. Um, it's easier to throw something out than to fix it. The grass is always greener on the other side of the fence, keeping up with the neighbors, um, thinking about what we should provide for children or loved ones. So there's so many different psychological components that go into this, including ego, um, that it's difficult to define all of the different emotional and psychological components, but those are the primary components. So it produces a lot of waste, it lowers quality, it takes up time, effort, energy, focus, it m shifts our focus from the present into the future and it creates anxiety. It also creates a feeling of, um, what I'm, I'm kind of thinking about what the actual word for the feeling would be. Um, feeling of unfairness or being cheated or perhaps, uh, you know, it's, it's that thought of, um, I should have, I wish I could have, rather than being satisfied with what we have, or if what we have is broken, fixing it. Um, so always thinking of the future and what we don't have, rather than what we do have. Um, so let's take this concept that most people living in this modern society have been trained in when we're dealing with anything material, um, including where we live, what we drive, how we communicate, anything like that. Um, a simple thing like a spoon. So you may have seen this 
on the internet. But think about a spoon. You can have one metal spoon for maybe 20 years. I, I have I have entire sets of silverware I've had for 20 years. Um, so you use a spoon, you wash a spoon, you dry a spoon, you use it again. You can use that spoon for 20 years. A plastic spoon, you use it once you throw it out. What goes in to the creation of those two spoons? Well, a metal spoon, the mining of the metal ore, the processing of that ore, the pouring of that ore into a mold, um, and possibly the sanding of that, the packaging of it, and the selling of it. All of those different things require transportation as well. And resources like water, uh, whatever produces the heat to, uh, to process the ore, things like that. But you do that one time. A plastic spoon takes all of those similar resources, takes petroleum, uh, it takes a lot of water, uh, it takes packaging, and you use it one time and you throw it out. So, um, it's kind of unbelievable, uh, this, this concept. Um, you can say the same thing about anything that's disposable. So first we can ask the question, is this needed? Is the packaging needed? Is, um, do we need this item that we can throw away or should I just pack some utensils and take them home? Um, so this concept of what we deserve is very different than what used to be the concept of what we should be doing um, for the benefit of ourselves, society, the environment. So I'd like to apply this to two different things. One is the concept of time and the present, and the other is to relationships. And I think that rationalized need and obsolescence affects both time and relationships. It's a byproduct um, of this mentality of modernity. Um, so let's think about time first. It's taken me a while to really buy into this concept, but time is the most precious commodity in your life. So when I think about how am I going to spend time, that's what it is. We all have a certain amount of time allotted to us. How am I going to spend my time? That's not what am I going to do with it. Think of time as currency, the most valuable currency that you have. How am I going to spend that currency? What am I going to get from that? Well, obviously, perhaps not so obviously, um, when we use that phrase, you know, if you had one more day to live, how would you spend your time? And apply that to your life every day. So, a Buddhist saying is um, every day a monk wakes up and imagines a little bird on his shoulder and that little bird says this is the last day of your life how will you live it and that's what they think of the first thing in the morning so when you think about time as the most valuable commodity currency you think about how am I going to spend this currency in my life, I automatically think about all the time I've wasted. Um, but most people 
um, would want to spend time with loved ones, helping others, altruistic things, perhaps experiencing nature, creation, uh, in worship, whatever it might be, but usually very positive ways. So compare that to how we spend time every day. So when I think about things like um, activities or work or things like that, I think about, yes, we all have to do things to survive so that we can purchase or grow food, um, be able to afford shelter and clothing and all of those needs. Um, but think about it this way. Think about, I am going to give my employer this much of my time, that's my currency, and I am going to trade them that many hours so that I can receive money. And that money will allow me to buy things. Some of the things are necessary, some are not necessary. Um, but so for instance, I'm going to sell eight hours of my day and energy in working and I am going to receive eight hours of pay and that will allow me to survive in a certain way and to purchase certain things. Um, but I'd like to begin to redefine spending time. How are we going to spend our time? Um, the other concept of time is this lack of focus on the present, which we've talked about previously. And um, when we're thinking about things we want, anything that is a want, that is a future-oriented focus, rather than thinking about what we have. Now this can be immediately translated into um, appreciating the people we're with and perhaps what we are blessed with. Um, so when we are focused on wants rather than haves, focused on what we don't have rather than what we do have, including people in our lives, then that creates anxiety. It creates um, kind of a negativity, a negative energy, uh, rather than a positive energy and a positive focus. So we can experience joy only in the present. Um, but a want is not in the present. A want is future oriented. And it is an unsettled feeling. Um, so it's almost as if I am not happy until. Um, okay, so that's time. Let's, let's apply it to relationships. So one of the things that, that has occurred um, in the United States is the number of relationships that people have how people act in those relationships and lo the longevity of relationships. And this could be friendships, but I really want to focus on uh, couples or families or marriages or something like that, significant other rela relationships. So um, when we think about this, um, many times uh, people enter into relationships and there is an impermanence 
to the concept of a relationship. We think to ourselves, it may fail, it may be successful. So already, the amount of commitment we invest in that relationship changes with the mentality that it is not a permanent relationship or may not be a permanent relationship. And this includes marriage, the commitment to marriage, the commitment to a significant other. Um, but when we think about applying the concept of rationalized need and obsolescence to relationships, it changes the whole pattern of relationships. So for one, when a relationship is broken and it creates anxiety and we're not happy. Pre-World War II, the concept was to fix the relationship or to make the best of the relationship. And I'm not saying that's always what should happen. There's abusive relationships. There's all kinds of negative things that can happen in relationships. But I'm just talking about our viewpoints in a normal relationship. Because every relationship has positives and negatives. Nobody's perfect. That's part of being human. Um, no relationship is perfect. Um, part of committing to a relationship was respect in that relationship. And by respect, that includes a number of things. Um, the way we talk with the other person, the time we spend with the other person, generosity, humbleness, um, treating them as we would want to be treated, um, things like that. But, so the first thing is, is basically that um, moving into a relationship, if every relationship will become broken at some point. Our choice is then, do we fix it or do we end it and get a new one? It is easier to end a relationship and to begin a new one than to fix a broken relationship. When there is abuse or safety issues or something like that, you end the relationship. But I'm talking a normal relationship. So part of the effort is to fix what's wrong with self that contributes to a problem in a relationship. And part of it is to um, work on the dialogue, the communication, the interaction with the other person in the relationship. So I always look at myself first and then I look at the interaction in the relationship and what's going on there. And perhaps the other person as well, but addressing the other person is not a blaming game. It's not pointing your finger. Um, using I feel statements. It's uh, respecting the other person, having a dialogue. Um, so fixing a relationship is much more difficult. But in if we apply the concept of obsolescence with things like, um, if you look on Facebook, most people's lives look excellent because um, people post their happiest moments. So every other relationship looks better. You don't know what happens in their private moments. You don't know their struggles. Um, but everybody has a struggle. But so that's the concept of obsolescence. Um, it's easier to end a relationship and start a new one. Um, if we do that and we enter into a new relationship, often the same cycle recurs. So for instance, if there's something going on with me that I need to fix, 
it's often easier just to move on to another relationship. But the same thing would recur. If I don't fix what's going on with me, if I have unfinished business, something like that, if I don't address my own issues first, the cycle will repeat itself. Um, and that's part of codependency. We'll talk about codependency if we talk about family, family counseling and pastoral counseling and couples therapy. But um, the other thing is, so talking about Facebook and how everything looks wonderful uh, in other people's relationships. So that's kind of like the grass is always greener. I deserve a better relationship. Um, but once we enter into another relationship, and it doesn't matter what relationship it is, there's going to be problems as well because we're imperfect, we're humans. So once again, we have to decide, are we going to fix a relationship and work on it together and grow together? So this whole concept of time, then, our time, how we want to spend it, and relationships and the concept of obsolescence and rationalized need, when you combine all of those things, I think it calls each of us to reevaluate this currency of time. How are we going to spend our time? We're going to spend it positively in the present, experiencing joy, working on relationships, um, things like that. And I've just really begun the process of writing this uh, concept down. It's been said a lot of different ways, um, but uh, I think applying it to uh, relationships and psychology and counseling um, can be very beneficial. And when we talk to others as pastoral or spiritual counselors, it just helps people to focus on what's important spiritually. Um, and by that I mean relationship-wise, everything. How am I going to live my life given this time? So I'd like to hear your thoughts on this because I'd like to enhance it. If you have other ideas to contribute, please let me know. And I'm looking forward to reading your comments. Thanks.